So we get into chapter 13. Notice this, verse 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. Meaning it doesn't matter how good I preach, Paul said. It doesn't matter how good I teach. It doesn't matter how many revelations I give unto you that have been given to me firsthand by Jesus Christ from the third heaven. It doesn't matter how deep I can, I can begin to extrapolate the hidden riches of Christ to you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All that matters is the love that I have from my heart that's delivered to you. It goes on to say in verse 2, though I have the gift. Now, now, see, now he's talking about gifts that he began to introduce in the previous chapter. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but if I don't have love, I am nothing. See, God is more concerned about fruit than he is gift. He's more concerned about fruit than gift. The gift will always manifest in due time if God has deposited on your life. And a person's gift will make room for itself even. But love has to be the motivating factor of each and every thing. And though I, verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So isn't this interesting, even connected to our giving? Now, Paul goes to the extreme to make an extreme point, that if he even sacrificed his body to be burned, but there wasn't love in the sacrifice. Previously, of course, saying, you know, though, though I, I, I sold everything I had. Because in today's economy, he was a multi, multi-millionaire. So he's saying, if I got rid of everything, I, if I sold everything I had, and all of that money that I was left with after selling everything, and I had millions and millions of dollars, if I gave it all to the homeless and gave it all to... Uh, you know, your Christian ministry that just focus on that and, and to the poor. If I didn't do it out of love, there's no profit in it. Can I help with this real quick theological sidebar here? When you see, there's a reason why, there's a ma- massive reason why when Paul, when he's talking about giving, isn't it interesting? He talks a lot about giving also the, the church of Corinth. When he says that don't ever give grudgingly or never give, which he covers in the book of St. Corinthians, or never give like, like out of compulsion, like you feel like you have to, or there again, specifically here I want to focus on, never give grudgingly, meaning never say, oh, I got to do this. Here's the main reason why. We just read it in 1 Corinthians 13. Because you're not giving out of love. When you don't give out of love, you'll never see the return. You'll never see the good measure pressed down, shaken together, overflow, return come into your life if you don't do it out of love. If you do it out of there again, there, there's, in, there, there's the slightest thread of giving out in, 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 in a grudging manner, in a grudging heart string. If you do that, it's like you ain't getting nothing off of that one. And a lot of Christians wonder why they try tithing. They give a few offerings, but it's all in a grudging manner. And they wonder why I didn't work for me. An elderly pastor shared this with me 35 years ago. Yeah, maybe a couple years longer than that. Actually, he wasn't sharing. He was talking to others, and I'm listening. I'm just kind of in the background listening to a degree. And, he, and he's talking about the importance, bottom line, the importance of your heart posture. And he said this. And he, he, he continued to talk, but I froze on this. He said this, motive is everything. Amen. 35 plus years ago, there, I, I could take you back to the exact place, time, and everything. He said, motive is everything. And I froze on that, and it stayed with me all that time. And of course, then he even quoted the scripture to tie into that. And it's so true. God does everything according to, yes, his word, but it's according to the heart. It's according to the heart. He makes it very clear in the book of Jeremiah. God tries the reins of the heart and proves what's in the heart so that he can give every person according to basically what's in the heart. 
Because the previous verse in Jeremiah 17 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And then the next verse, God says, I, the Lord, I try the reins of the heart. Because I want to prove, prove to yourself that it becomes manifested what's in your heart, and then I reward you according to what's in your heart. Are we getting this thing? you got to tithe out of love. you got to give offerings out of love. you got to serve out of love. And, and that's not the case here, but just in case it tries to creep in, don't, don't usher if you can't do it out of love. Don't greet if it ain't out of love. Do not dare. Do not dare work in the nursery if it ain't out of love. Do not, do not minister to our children if it can't be done out of love. Don't do anything in the kingdom if the motive isn't love. Bottom line. Bottom line. He goes on to say, now now he begins to not only define love, but 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 he begins to explain the workings of love. Verse 4. I know you're familiar with this. Let's read it. Love suffers long, meaning, of course, it's very patient. Love is very patient, is it not? And love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Oh, my, isn't that the truth? Love is not showy. Love doesn't have to tell you how much it loves you on everything it does. Oh, I did that because I love you. Love doesn't parade itself like that. Love doesn't have... <laughs> some of you are laughing and some of you are going, yeah, because you've, you've seen people like that, huh? It's like... Oh, yeah, we, we did. It's like, oh, no, you shouldn't even share that. Now you're not, now you're going, no, nah, yeah. Anyway, love never parades itself. It's not puffed up, meaning it's not haughty. Uh, love does not behave rudely. Love is never, ever rude. Amen. You know, sometimes, church, if we're not careful, you know, and I know sometimes, you know, people say, well, it's my nature, and where I work, everyone's like that. Well, you're not everyone. And don't bring that in the house of God. Don't bring it to me. Don't be rude to me. Don't be rude to the people of God here in this church. I surely don't want it. I got, I got devils out there I deal with too, just like you do throughout the week. They're rude to me, and, I, and sometimes I don't tolerate it. Sometimes I'll call people short and say, you know what? I don't let my own children talk to me that way. And I sure in the world ain't going to let you talk to me that way. We should never be rude. Oh, I was, I, was just, I was just kidding. No, you weren't. You're rude. There's a spirit of rudeness on the inside of people. They're always doing that kind of stuff, always poking at this and making fun of that and belittling someone. That, it's just rude, man. That is the antithesis of love. Love isn't childish. Oh, oh, I'm not preaching to anyone. I'm just saying that. Love isn't rude. <laughs> love, love does not seek its own. It's not provoked. And another thing, love thinks no evil. It does, not, it does not rejoice in iniquity. Oh, meaning this, that when, it, when, when a brother or sister falls, you're not happy about it. You're not happy about it. Any, if any Christian has ever rejoiced in your demise, they are not 100% born again. I'm going on record to say that. They're not. You can't be born again. There's no, the love of God is not in their heart in that area. When they rejoice over someone who has fallen, transgressed, or has gone into a tailspin in their life. That is not the love of God. That is not the God that I serve. That is not the Savior, Jesus Christ, that I serve and that saved me. And that is not the moving and ministry of the Holy Spirit whatsoever. Case closed. Oh, we got we to go on, got to go on. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love, I love this one statement here, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, meaning he's mentioning one of the nine gifts of the Spirit. See, some people want to use that scripture and say, oh, see, we, we shouldn't exercise the gift of tongues because right there. No, it just says one of these days. That means that the consummation of the ages, meaning Christ comes back, the church, and, and, and after the, after the uh, judgment seat of Christ, great white throne judgment, and we, we step into final, final, eternity, eternity, which has no finality to it. Did you catch all that? Then tongues will cease. Prophecies will cease then. And then also what's the other thing that will cease? Knowledge. 
Well, the reason why knowledge is going to cease then in the consummation of the ages in, in the eternity future is because the Bible says then we will know as we are known. I mean, we will have complete full knowledge. Yes. We will have complete knowledge. We will have 100% unequivocal consummate knowledge that there is no need for it anymore. So those three things are going to cease. Notice this. For no, now we know in part, we prophesy in part, when that which is perfect, complete, uh, has come, there again. That, that means a lot. I summarize as consummation of all things. Then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. When I became a man, I put away childish things. I became a man to put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, of course, uh, the, the mirrors at that time didn't have a clear-cut reflection like we do now. But then face-to-face, -face, now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Real quick-like, I shouldn't digress much on this. Bottom line, you know, a lot of people say, you know, I have a lot of questions I'm going to ask God when I get to heaven. You won't need to. You'll have perfect knowledge. Yes. You'll know everything. Yes. You'll know why it happened. When it, you know, you'll, you, it, it'll be complete. You won't have to go to God and say, hey, why did... You'll know. Okay, so going on to say, now abides faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And I, I know you realize this, but we, we need to remind ourselves, you know, we, you know, that the love we have for God, the only reason we have that is because he's loved us. We're just trying to reciprocate <laughs> What he's already bestowed upon us and in us. The only reason we have love for God and love for people is because we've, we've, we've captured at least a small degree of his love in our heart and life. So when we, when we ever want to start getting haughty about, oh, you know, I have so much love toward people. Which I know we'd never say that or do that or think that even. But any degree of love we have, it's all come from him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the person of our sin. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Turn to somebody and say, I love you. I love you. And, and, and it is. It really is easy. When you have the love of God in your heart, it is easy to love people, isn't it? It's, easy, it's, easy, it's even easy to love the unlovable because you don't let them get to you. Right? Because you know they're walking in darkness or living in darkness, and you overcome that by the love of God, Right? Look at this, verse 12. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and, he, and his love has been perfected in us. None of us has seen God. You know, one of the reasons why, I know you know what this means. Let, let me communicate it like this. This is one of the reasons why I know God exists, because I see him in you. I see his love in you. Now, I've never seen him. I've never seen him with the naked eye. The Bible says you can't and live. That's how great his glory is. I've never had a vision of him or anything like that. But I know he exists for several reasons. One of the reasons is because of this. Because he exists through you. Your love is shed abroad from your heart by the Holy Spirit. That alone lets me know there is a God. Your love toward me makes me believe in God. Your love toward my family makes me believe in God. Your love toward one another makes me believe in God. Your love toward humanity, toward the lost, toward your family, toward your children, toward other, that makes me believe there is a God. Amen. Does that make sense? That's really what John is saying there. If we've never seen God at any time, and to the degree that we love God proves that God abides in us right there. We've seen him in that regard. 13, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior to the world. Whoever confessed that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. My life mission, and really your life mission, you don't have to be in full-time ministry, but definitely a true pastor's life mission is to let people know that God loves them, that God is a God of love. I communicate it this way, that he's a good God. And then from that, I let it be known that he's so good that he loves you. 
He loves you when you fail. He loves you when you mess up. He loves you when you make mistakes. He loves when you say things you shouldn't have said. He loves when, when you backslide. Uh, he, he still loves you when you backslide. He, he, he loves you. He loves you in spite of yourself. He still loves you in, in your shortcomings. He loves you when you have a temper tantrum. He loves you if you, if you thought a thought you shouldn't have thought. He still loves you. He still loves you in the midst of all of that, in spite of all that. He still loves you if you have weak faith. He still loves you if you didn't exercise your faith when you should have. He still loves you if you forgot to tithe. Well, just for that one time. He still... Make sure you're still following me there. He still loves you. Tell somebody, he still loves me. He still loves you because of his, because of his eternal goodness. He loves you all at all times through every season of your life. For more information about our teaching resources, visit our website at ciclive.com.